Hey guys, how's it going? This is Derek Craig with another oldfoodbasics.com Discover podcast. I'm glad to have you on. This is the podcast where we learn something new about our incredible on every single episode. Today, we're actually going to be talking about some specialty drilling additives. So this is a world, I mean, <laughs> a lot of us are probably familiar with, even at least remotely familiar with, with drilling, but you know, uh, we're going to talk about some interesting uh, additives that you know, we're probably less commonly known about. And so I'm pretty excited to dive into that material. Uh, before we get in there, we've got a full packed episode, so I'm going to skip out on some you know, typical announcements stuff that I would have at the beginning of these and I mean, my kind of stagger uh, release dates around too. So just a heads up, you know, we've got interns now, so we're producing podcasts out the wazoo. It's hard for me to keep up with. <laughs> so I'm no longer announcing episode numbers because, you know, they might be moved around in terms of release dates and stuff, but a lot of fantastic content coming at you guys and always be sure to, you know, follow us on LinkedIn. Um, to, to see when we're publishing new content. That's where we always uh, do posts and stuff whenever we um, publish something to our website. Of course, follow OFABasics.com. Check that out occasionally and check out our new courses and podcasts and videos and, and new content that we're uh, adding. And you'll see a lot more of that coming out this summer, especially with the, the help of the interns. And, and speaking of the interns, I've got one here with me today. He's actually going to be co-hosting this podcast with me. Um, his name is uh, Jacob Mata, and he's a senior petroleum engineering student from University of Texas at Austin. So he's a longhorn. <laughs> uh, but great to have you on board, Jacob. Yes, it's great to be here. Thank you for the introduction. Um, yeah, no it's also a pleasure, Mon, to be on this episode co-hosting with you. It's actually my first time doing a podcast. So that's something a little nerve-wracking, but also very exciting for me. Um, right. Also excited to learn more about this episode's topic with today's guest, who I'll introduce in a bit. Um, a little bit about my background, as Derek said, I'm a senior at the University of Texas at Austin. I will be graduating this upcoming fall, and I'm majoring in petroleum engineering as well as minoring in both business and entrepreneurship. Um, this summer, I actually had or have had the unique opportunity to join Oilfield Basics team. Uh, this comes after my original internship plan was rescinded or canceled due to coronavirus. Um, so I'm very thankful for this opportunity. Um, with Oilfield Basics as a drilling and completions intern, um, I'm actually focused on gaining a better understanding of common operations and considerations for offshore and development, as well as hydraulic fracturing operations. And Derek, once again, just want to say thank you for having me on board and looking forward to a great rest of the summer. <laughs> awesome, Jacob. Well, thank you for your background there. And, you know, of course, we're uh, more than happy to have you on board too. And I'm already doing a lot of exciting things on, on the topics and stuff that you discussed that you're focusing on this summer. So I'm looking forward to a lot of um, great content um, being uh, captured in, 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 with, with your help this summer. And, and like Jacob said, he's focusing on some offshore topics and he's also kind of a, you know, our general uh, DNC intern or one of them. We've got another one that's also focused on uh, within uh, the DNC realm. So uh, these kind of topics you know, are definitely going to fall under uh, um, uh, either Jacob or other intern Parag, uh, which we'll hear from, I'm sure, some point here soon. Um, on one of our podcasts, but uh, you know he's focusing on offshore and then also um, the completions realm. So uh, more so, uh, kind of uh, at the ground level in a sense, so like the actual operations and um, you know managing the pumps and like you know what happens at surface and logistics of everything and that kind of. He's trying to create some really good content around that space. So I'm sure we've got a lot of listeners who are actively engaged within that space of the industry. So please definitely reach out if you guys have any good suggestions for content or would like to uh, work with us to produce some really good resources. You know, if someone's just coming into that space, especially so uh, Jacob and I are both relatively unfamiliar with offshore oil and gas, which is one of the reasons that we wanted to focus him on this and really get some really good content uh, for someone who's just looking at, into, you know, what on <laughs> earth happens on offshore oil and gas, right? None of us have a really strong idea. We've heard some things, obviously, you know, we're a little bit accustomed to it, but nothing uh, really beyond the surface. So we're really hoping to get some good content put together on that. And, and of course, there's other topic too. So really encourage you guys to reach out, even if you just want to, you know, get on the podcast and just talk, tell us about your experiences, you know, like uh, put all these dots together for us, whatever, just reach out to us. You can find us both on LinkedIn. Um, you can also email, um, contact the Wiffle Basics, um, that's for me.com. And then also uh, jacob.matta at Wolf of Basics for his email. I can drop both of those in the show notes for this episode too. So reach out, for, uh, reach out to us. We'd love to have you guys um, help out with, the, with this content and, and really create a resource that we can all learn from and, and develop together. So with all that said, <laughs> we're excited to, to dive into this episode, obviously, you know, in the DNC realm. So I'll let uh, Jacob further uh, introduce our, our guest, Cole, and we'll, we'll get this kicked off. <laughs> yes, uh, definitely. Like Derek said, please reach out if y'all 
if you or you know anyone who um, just willing to talk, um, I like to meet with you, whether it's offshore operations or hydraulic fracturing operations. But uh, sorry, with that, I'd like to take this time to introduce today's guest on our Discover podcast, Cole Harrison. He is a graduate of Texas A&M University and is currently a sales account manager at Drill Kim. We have been working with him and Drill Kim for a while, and we are excited to finally have him on the podcast. How are you doing today, Cole? Doing great. Beautiful day out here in Midland. Thanks for having me on, Derek <laughs> and Jacob. Good. <laughs> that's good yeah, no problem at least one of us is in middle at least someone's in the middle of the action i guess right? <laughs> oh, there you go <laughs> whatever action is left right <laughs> yeah it's, it's it's still going it's still booming out here but you can definitely tell things are, are slowing down and, and hopefully it'll bottom out soon yeah yeah hopefully so it looks like we got a little bit of a sign of recovery with with prices but we'll see how things kind of see how things go from here but uh great to, great to have you on the show you know as as cole had mentioned we're, we're kind of formulating a partnership basically uh, with drill cam to get a lot of uh, content in this, in this area. You guys do a lot of things, um, you know, within drilling and also completions and like the work over side. Right. So we're pretty excited to work with you guys on some content. We've got this podcast. We're in another podcast talking about uh, what kind of the focus on the, the work over kind of completions end of, of some additives and, and the operations, some equipment that's used to run them. Um, and then also, you know, follow up with some lunch and learns in between all this. And we'll, we'll announce more on this and we'll get specific with dates and everything as we go. But uh, pretty excited to, to have you on, on board here, Cole, and, and helping out with the material and love to learn more about uh, you and your background and also, you know, some of the stuff that um, Joe Kim's going to be throwing at us. Yeah, absolutely. There's a lot that we have. So uh, I'll try to give a high level overview today. And then, as you mentioned, as we have these lunch and learns, uh, kind of over the next month or so, we'll really dive into the weeds there. Um, so thanks for having me on. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, tell us what, uh, what got you into uh, uh, Drill Kim, what, what exactly you do um, you know, with, with Drill Kim and, and whatnot. Just fill us on a, a little bit about uh, your background. Yeah, a little bit about myself. Uh, I grew up in West Columbia. It's a small, old, former boom town, about an hour southwest of Houston. And in fact, our, our junior high mascot were the Rouseabouts, and in high school, we were the Roughnecks. <laughs> so I grew up around uh, some of those, those old oil fields, but really, I got my start in the oil and gas business with Oil States Industries, which is the offshore arm of Oil States International. And uh, I graduated from Texas A&M with an economics degree. And so I enjoyed being in oil and gas. And then as the, the kind of the fall career fairs were coming around, all the recruiters on the service side were saying, oil is not going to go below $120 a barrel, $100 a barrel for at least the next five to 10 years. So, so that, yeah, that sounds exciting. I'd love to have a stable, high paying career. And uh, ended up with National Oil Varco. Yeah, ended up at, at NOV. And they had a training program, which was four rotations of three months each. And so when I, when I had signed my offer letter within a week, OPEC said we're not cutting production. So started my, my career off on a uh, pretty tumultuous time in the business, but uh, at NOV, learned a lot. It was a great training program. I'm sure some of your engineers might be familiar where, whether if you're in drilling and they put you in completions and then production and then at the end of the year, whichever one you like best or whichever one you, you fit in the best, that's where you ended up. So uh, as the same thing at NOV, you ranked which discipline you wanted to be in. For me, it was sales, business development, and then finance. And, uh, and through that, my first rotation was in corporate with corporate strategy. And that was actually my first time out in Midland uh, with Reed Heikelog looking at market share and ways to improve that. My second one was also on the drilling side, but that was more to manufacturing facilities. So seeing... Uh, drillers cabins being built from from start to finish and then my third one was also uh, in the um, in the well board department but on the finance side and so traditionally at the end of the program you would go to Reliance Stadium and just like a, a NCAA draft they would they would draft whichever whichever department kind of had the, the worst performing metrics they would they would have first pick to try to boost that department and so <laughs> But with, with everything that was going on, the industry was just falling apart. So they said, wherever, you know, the, the draft has been, has been canceled. So wherever you, mm. you get a full-time offer from, you know, we advise you to take it. So anyway, I ended up at a quality tubing, which is a cool tubing arm in NOV. And so I spent some time there and at quality tubing, handled uh, some big accounts and 
really Halliburton is where I cut my teeth. And, and so traveled down to the Gulf and South Texas and even went to Panama for their Latin America operations. So, and then some of these meetings, I was the youngest guy in the room by 20 years. So you learn a lot. And anyway, but I wanted to really get out in the field and learn, the, learn things from the bottom up. And so in 2017, July 2017, I told my wife, if we, if we found an opportunity in the Eagleford or the Permian, let's take it. Uh, we didn't, we don't have a kid at the time. Now we have a three month old beautiful daughter, but we didn't really have any, any risk. So let's go out there, let, let's take it. And so that's how I ended up at drill camp and spent the majority of my time driving two, 300 miles a day out to Carlsbad two, three times a week, you know, and, and so really just learning things from bottom up, talking with the company man, the superintendents, learning how things are done out there and uh, eating plenty of Allsup's burritos as well. <laughs> But so, yeah, now now I'm out in Midland. Drill Kim itself is headquartered in the Woodlands Spring area. And there we have a, a full in-house lab with chemists. They're constantly looking at new products, ways to improve our current products we have as the systems change. And out here in Midland and, and most of our other locations, we also have some engineers that help out with our applications. And it's not just a fancy title we'll give them. They're actually Texas A&M grads, LSU Marietta, I know you went there. Then, <laughs> yeah, better throw that one in there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I didn't wanna, and then mines as well. So uh, we have some, some pretty bright mines that we have. And so drill chem itself doesn't actually provide the drilling mud like your public companies, your big guys, AES does, or your independents like out here, you have Horizon, Buckeye, Zia Fluids, whoever it might be that are providing the actual mud systems, Bay Ride, Bend Night Lime, whatever it is actually running that. So we provide products in addition to what they run. And so I'll go over, uh, I'll have an overview of drilling fluids, inhibitors that we run, drilling lubricants and beads, and then wall circulation material. Awesome, man. Well, sounds like you've definitely been all over the place. <laughs> I didn't even realize that you had that much of a, a, a background, like every single division almost of, of upstream, it seems. <laughs> yeah, it, like I said, it's it, it was a pretty tough time, but you know, with, it was with it being so tough and unfortunate layoffs and everything, you kind of get paid to do two or three jobs. And so you learn so much more doing that. So I've enjoyed it. Like I said, I like to get my hands dirty and learn things from the ground up and, and actually how it's ran. And I, I suggest that to any interns coming up, any young engineers, any salesmen, whoever really to get out there because once you're married, it's harder to get back and spend that time out in the field where you're gone all day. So I definitely uh, think that was beneficial for my career. Are you still spending uh, any time out in the field or are you mostly office based now? Well, so my role has changed uh, now, like you mentioned, I'm a sales account manager. So I still do have some, some select accounts out here in Midland and then also covering Colorado and Wyoming as far as the field goes. And then Denver, Dallas, Fort Worth and Midland offices. So typically I would split it up like, we were doing some work in, up in the powder in Wyoming. So I'd fly into Denver, drive up to Douglas, spend a few days there, hit rigs, make sure customers are taken care of, yeah. and then head back down to, to downtown Denver for meetings there. So now it's, I'm still driving, just not as much. It's more <laughs> transition from a truck to a plane. I got you. <laughs> Awesome. Well, well, in terms of just kind of getting this all kicked off and, and getting everybody oriented and on the same page here. So you know, we, we've talked, you know, we've already kind of thrown in the, the concept of, of drilling mud, right? So I just wanted to help, you know, provide a little bit more of um, uh, an understanding in terms of where this exactly fits in to the industry um, in terms of on the drilling side, exactly. So I'll just let you take that. Um. Yeah, absolutely. Drilling mud is one of the, the most important components while you're drilling a well, because it's gonna cool the bit, and so that way you can get your cuttings out and your, your bits cooling, but also that way you don't have blowouts. So you're trying to keep that, that formation pressure from, from coming up, and so a lot of times guys will get in trouble because their mud weight might be too light and they might take a kick, and when that happens, you got a blowout or whatever. So really out here in West Texas, there's two main types of, of mud systems. And that's going to be oil-based mud and water-based mud. Water-based mud can be fresh water, but most of the, of the water-based systems I see are brine. However, uh, some operators are, are going back to fresh water. So when I first started, guys had just had really 
started running oil-based mud and gotten away from, from those water-based systems. Well, now you kind of see it coming back around. And so, so especially out here in the Midland Basin, some guys will run fresh water in their, for their systems. And then on the Delaware side, a lot of guys will run brine. And really, it just depends on formation characteristics. Some formations might swell or react to water-based mud. And then, uh, like on the Delaware side, a lot of operators will run brine in their bone springs wells. So really it's just formation specific and, and obviously operator preference. But really, I'd say the vast majority of operators will run brine in the intermediate and then they'll swap over to oil based mud for their lateral. And so the, the reason behind that is oil based mud is sometimes you'll hear 70, 30, 75, 25 or 80, 20. And I mean, you know, 80 percent diesel. And with having that much diesel in your system makes it very vicious. So with these laterals getting longer, operators will switch over to that oil based mud for their lateral. So that way, as they get further out, they'll have a, a more uh, lubricious fluid in there. And then on most wells, you'll have basic products such as corrosion inhibitors, and that's to protect casing, drill pipe, just because these fluids that were down there are just so nasty. And you have H2S coming up, so you'll see a lot of H2S scavenger to go down there and really bust up uh, that hydrogen sulfide. And both of those products you'll, you'll typically see are on a trailer, and they're hooked up to a pump. So you can dial them in a half a gallon an hour or whatever. So you'll run that through your water-based system. And then a, a really big problem that we see, uh, it, it kind of comes and goes, but especially on the Delaware side, the red beds, which are in the surface interval. And so it's a very water sensitive formation. It's easily hydratable. And when that happens, it can swell, you'll get stuck pipe and you'll have to end up going fishing or, or, or sidetrack and, and so it's really definitely just, heard about these <laughs> yeah and it can you know it, it can get pretty nasty pretty quick so we have some shell inhibitors that we pump one is a solid product and the other one is in liquid form the solid product is shell x so you'll hear about sulfonated asphalts and we have grade a some products are are blends of asphalts that are a b c and d we just have grade a we found it to be more efficient to reduce your usage. So we're cutting usage by 30 to 50% less product, but that's pumped in sweeps and it'll mechanically seal the formation. Whereas the Hydroforce, which is a KCL substitute, yeah, that's really used as a pretreatment. Some guys will pump sweeps, other guys will juice the system and uh, that'll actually chemically inhibit the shell so it's not reacting. And so that way you don't have any issues while you're drilling to that surface. And then some operators just don't want to full fit at all. And they'll hire a turnkey sputter rig, which is just a, a small rig, and they'll drill surface, they'll set surface casing. So the, the big rigs don't have to worry about that. And so the big rig will show up and all they have to do is finish out the intermediate and lateral and keep moving on. So that, that saves time and, and really saves or reduces risk on the operator side because these guys are doing it for a set cost. So I was wondering you're, when you were talking about hydroforce and you were talking about how it inhibits the clays by suppressing the hydration and swelling associated with water absorption. So could you kind of explain um, why exactly uh, the clay, clay swelling is something that um, is not something you want? <laughs> yeah, for sure. Well, and, and so it's basically uh, potassium chloride. So in these different formations, sometimes Again, it's, you'll hear all kind of chemical names thrown out, but the hydroforce itself will actually go in there and instead of, you know, where operators get into trouble is if they run fresh water through that interval. And what, what happens is, especially if you, if you take a while, something goes wrong, whatever, it'll, it'll, I mean by hydrate, it'll get into the formation and then it'll basically start to swell. And so some guys just run brine and, and get through it as quickly as they can whereas other guys want to be safe, and so they'll pump our hydrofores. Okay, and are these pretty much all in, like, the shallower zones? So you're talking, like, whenever they're basically doing, um, you know, the vertical section of, of the well, just drilling through all these different zones, and they're still using water-based, whether it's brine or fresh, um, and then they're adding these in, or is this even throughout the, the lateral, um, even when you're using the oil-based? 
uh, the majority of operators will just run it in their surface interval, sometimes kind of going into their intermediate. Okay, gotcha. And then you said some of them are pumped in like the sweep format or fashion. <laughs> so yeah. basically it's like a bulk treatment circulate through the system, right? And then what was the other option? Right, like so chemically inhibited. Right, and and when I mean pumped in sweeps, so you have your slug and pit, and so you'll you'll mix up a pill as it's called. Uh, typically, eighty barrels. Sometimes you'll see hundred barrels, but usually it's an eighty barrel pill, and you'll pop ten to fifteen barrel sweeps depending on your hole size. And um, so that's how you'll run that. And then again with the hydro force, some guys will just put it over the suction pit and just let it run in if they are going to so-called juice the system or do a system treatment. There's different names for it. Oh, okay. So that's just kind of like a continual um, treatment in a sense that just always being added to the system. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And okay. for, for something like the, the corrosion inhibitors, there's actually, you'll have a, a metal ring that you'll put in the mud. So that way, once you get done drilling that interval, you can take it out. We sent it to our lab with you some bell weigh it to see just how bad things are in that well, because, you know, in certain areas, you might need to increase your usage more because things are just so nasty down the hole. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then on the, the corrosion, could you just go into a little bit more depth in terms of just, you know, what is it, again, I think you might have said it earlier, but just kind of breezed over, you know, what are we trying to protect, the, you know, what, what's corroding, right, uh, right down right. hole that we're concerned about? Yeah, absolutely. So you're protecting casing and drill pipe, which is a big one because rig contractors typically require that. They lease the pipe out to these operators, so which can get pretty costly. And then obviously on the production side, your production engineers will say, oh yes, you know, <laughs> please run that, that corrosion inhibitor because when it comes time to, to produce the well, you don't want holes in your casing. You're trying to extend the life of that casing so you can get as much production out of it as you can. So the corrosion inhibitor kind of keeps that bias up for the, the bacteria away from, from eating up your casing and drill pipe. Okay. So it's kind of like the, the, so it's going after the bacteria basically. Um, exactly, does it stay yep. in the, the well then? I mean, like, um, cause I, otherwise how would it really protect against casing? Um, so do you circulate that like, uh, you know, before they cement or something or, or where does that, how does it stay in the system in other words? Right, right. Well, so you'll run that. And then when you swap over to old base mud, that has a lot more, uh, kind of corrosion inhibiting properties just due to the nature of, the fluids that you're pumping down holes. So some guys will pump packer fluid. So we've had some operators that say, we're gonna drill this well, but we don't plan to frack it for a few months. So we'll have some, it's called packer fluid, but we'll run that and and that'll just kind of basically sit in the well bore and it, it won't allow that, that bacteria just to go wild. And uh, even with cold tubing, I know we'll touch that on the completion side, but we saw that quite a bit. If, if you don't pump anything, through this steel, bacteria will just completely eat it up. You have, the water is most, most often dirty, especially if it's coming from frack tanks or, or whatever. So that's one of the most important aspects. So the static packer that you're talking about kind of just preserves the well, basically, while they're waiting for completions? Exactly, yep. Okay. And you, you'll hear terms such as pickling. You know, we pickle okay. the well. So that way you don't get there and come back, there's holes in your casing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Right. And that's just, you said packer fluid, right? That's not an actual uh, packer installation. Right, right. Just packer fluid okay. is what it goes by. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, no, this is <laughs> interesting. And then the H2S uh, inhibitors you talked about, is that pretty much just uh, active, like whenever it's going through the system, like so um, it'll prevent you know, the formation of H2S. So like, you know, whenever the rig's drilling or something in case they have a blowout, like you, I think you mentioned, right? That it doesn't cause issues at surface or cause life, loss of life, right? But does that, does that stay? kind of active in the well, like the corrosion inhibitors do, uh, would, or I'm just curious how this kind of, do, does, do these things like soak into the formation and like change anything actually in the formation or like, I'm just curious, like to understand that part, I guess. I don't know how, how yeah. else to phrase it. <laughs> right, right. No, I mean, as you drill, you open these formations up. And so that hydrogen sulfide is just coming through that formation. So some of your listeners might've seen the iron orchard and back in the day, it, it showed a, a picture where they were up on the brick floor and they had a bird chirping. And so once the bird stopped chirping, that's when, you know, you had H2S coming up. And so now, <laughs> now we have, I have heard of that actually. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that was, that was way back, way back before my time, but 
Now we have H2S monitors, and so when you pause the location, you'll see red flag for saying, don't come on location because H2S is so bad. Yellow is saying, well, we've had some issues, and then green is everything's fine as of right now. So it, it really depends. I mean, and, and that also plays a part with your mud. You, you, you want to keep these uh, – Keep H2S at bay because, but sometimes as, as it comes back, as it's it's going through the system and everything, you just can't help it. So that's where the H2S scavenger will go down and really bust up the, the hydrogen sulfide down there. So um, sometimes it can be bad, but but most of the time you'll you'll hit a little spot of it and then you can you can keep rolling. But uh, another operator here, I think they threw a flame. They took a kick and it was like a twenty foot flame and burned the side of the of the doghouse. So oh wow. Yeah. So have you noticed that uh, this HOS problem or I guess precaution, like is it uh, real prevalent out there in West Texas or have you noticed it being more um, uh, cause for concern in other locations compared to the Permian? I would say the Permian is one of the worst. And like, for instance, it's not as bad as it used to be, but when I first started going on location, you had to be clean shaven. Uh, you couldn't have any, any scruff or anything because it was so bad that, if you had to put on a, a respirator to, to help you breathe in oxygen, then they wanted to be able to make sure you had a good fit. And then people have kind of gone away from them. They've loosened the restrictions. You don't see as many signs on, on doors saying, absolutely don't come in if you're not clean shaven. So yeah, I would say that the Permian is the worst. And then some other areas, you know, you can have a beard. And, and so it's kind of, kind of correlates with just how bad the monitor yeah. uh, that H2S is and some, most operators will require you to have an H2S monitor on depending on mm -hmm. what you're doing. Yeah, it is definitely uh, one of my first internships was actually in, in Eagleford. And I remember I rolled up on, on site and it was like, um, the, the PPM was like 10,000. It was like written on the board, like big oh. letters and like nobody else was around. Like evidently they went home early and then we still rolled up and just kind of went in the company, you know, made sure nobody else was around. And mm. I'm like, are they all dead or did they leave? Like what <laughs> happened here? <laughs> So yeah, as Texas is definitely very bad about it. Um, Appalachian stuff like up here, you know, it exists in some zones, but not really the primary zone that we're going after. And then like um, you know, my, my time in like kind of the, the Colorado, Wyoming area, like you don't even really hear about it much hardly at all. So, but the interesting thing about um, h 2 too is it can cause cor corrosion, um, especially downhole too. So um, do you typically run those in pairs then? Like you, whenever you run the corrosion inhibitor, you'd run the h 2 scavenger or like vice versa, typically, at least in, at least in Texas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Most of the time, you'll have them both hooked up. So, okay, gotcha. Yeah. That is something I do find kind of interesting because, I guess, still being um, in school, working towards my undergraduate, you learn about the the dangers of H two S as far as from a health standpoint or perspective, but you don't really learn about the effects that it could have, like as far as corrosion on your actual system. So that's something interesting to me. Mm -hmm. No, definitely. And <laughs> one of the things that uh, whenever you get out in industry and stuff, you don't, you know, it's not one of the first things you run home and tell your mom, you know, that you were out <laughs> on the site with, <laughs> you know, basically you could have taken one breath and, and died, you know, if the conditions were wrong. So, mm -hmm. but uh, thankfully we've got you know, a lot, a lot of tools to, to combat it. And, you know, that obviously um, this being one of them and all the monitoring and stuff on site too. So if we can prevent it ahead of time, great. Otherwise, you know, monitor and, and you know, have good plays in, in you know, in your playbook <laughs> if, you know, yeah. if you do see that service. So, <laughs> But yeah, well, we could spend all day you know, on, on inhibitors and stuff. I know we got a lot more to, to go through in this kind of overview. So I think, um, so that, that's inhibitors, right? And then um, you had lubricants, right? Is another uh, primary grouping in a sense of, of additives that we wanted to hit on. Right, right. And, and as these laterals get longer, I'd, I'd say the standard right now is two miles, but it, it keeps going further, two and a half. You've, guys are drawing three mile laterals now. So Historically, especially if you talk to the guys that have been doing it for 40 years, they say, oh, man, nothing slicker than old base mud. And you know, as we talked about, it is pretty slick. But as these laterals just keep getting longer and longer, the further you get towards total depth or TD, sometimes you got to have something to take the bite out of that torque or else you're just going to tear up your pipe, you could twist off. And so most operators will have a, a torque threshold set, so say 26,000 foot-pounds or uh, some operators will, walk, will run uh, heavy torque drill pipe. And so that'll increase their torque ceiling. And so that way, if they're running a freshwater system, it just kind of gives them more leeway. And so that's one of the things that, that we've really done well with is running our drill loop HD, which stands for high torque, high temp 
we run it all over the country and it's a synthetic based lube. And why I mentioned that is because some products are diesel based, but if you're running a diesel based system, it doesn't make sense to add more diesel to an already diesel based system. So, and that's typically ran and three to 5% sweeps. And again, it's made up in, in 100 or 80 to 100 barrel, but I'd say the standard is 80 barrel pill and you're pumping 10 to 15, sometimes 20 barrel sweeps. And then as that sweep exits the bit, you can see, you'll see the drop in torque. And so what that does is our loop has a high infinity to metal. And, and so it, it'll stick to that drill pipe pretty well and it'll decrease that friction as you get further out naturally with all that pipe that you have getting further and further out, 10,000, nine, nine or 10,000 foot down and then 10,000 foot out and increasing, you're gonna increase the, or you're gonna increase the friction of the formation with that pipe. So you want something to really help you out because uh, your motor could stall if, if your torque is going up. And if, if you're having torque and drag issues, that's also gonna lower your rate of penetration or ROP. And so the goal is to have a high rate of ROP, which in turn shaves drilling time off and will ultimately save the customer money. Do you see um, more com more customers using it if they're using like um, kind of conventional rotary steer or like conventional um, methods of you know, directional drilling or whether, you know, they're using um, the conventional or like, sorry, goodness, my, I'm all over the place here and trying to get these words out. The, the rotary steerable kind of systems with that you aren't actually turning the entire drill string, you know, as you go out further than the lateral. Like, do you see a difference in um, application there in terms, again, the conventional versus rotary steerable is what I was trying to say earlier. <laughs> right, right. Uh, I mean, again, it's up to operator, operator preference. So most of the tools we see are just your conventional motors. We do see the rotary steerables and we've definitely helped some guys get out of, out of a bind with that. Uh, the problem with that is you're constantly rotating. So naturally you're going to have more torque with a uh, rotary steerable, but um, even some of our operators before they run casing, they'll spot a pill. And so you, you'll hear slicker pill. So yeah, we made up a slicker pill before we run casing. So they'll spot that pill on the bottom. And then that way, when you get ready to run casing, it's not going to get stuck anywhere. It'll just slide on down to the bottom. Okay. Now, and you said it has an affinity to metal, right? So are, it, does it not? So then whenever you're going to run casing or something, how does it, um, does it coat, kind of coat onto the, the, the edges of, of the well bore? Than two yeah, or... exactly. And so it, it'll, as that casing goes down, it'll basically just coat the casing and, and the formation. So it'll just ease it on down because some operators, they'll they have heck with getting casing to bottom in, it'll get stuck. And it, it's just a <laughs> complete nightmare that you could be sitting on that for a while. So as a cheap insurance policy, operators will, will spot that slicker pill. And then Really, what, what our lab does in Houston, they do a few things, and I'll talk about LCM in, here in a little bit, but uh, some operators will say, here's our fluid properties. What lube do you recommend us riding? And our drill lube HT is compatible in fresh water and oil based mud. And you really want to look at the pH and the hardness because you want to have a, a lubricant that will tolerate those fluid properties because sometimes you might see foaming or something. And so if it's, if it's on the line or, or an operator is just curious, we'll send it into Houston to our lab there with engineer's permission. And they'll run compatibility testing and saying it didn't alter the rheology of your mud. It, it, you know, it didn't change the properties. And we also do lubricity testing. So as you increase weight on bit, how much is this loop going to help me? So we'll do lubricity testing as well. And then uh, our other product is drill lube SS. And so that's ran in those high brand systems. So uh, if they do have the high pH or really that, that high hardness. It'll really help out there. And uh, in those water-based systems, most operators will just pump it at 3% sweeps because it has just so much more of an effect of, of taking off that, of reducing that torque. But also some will run that system concentration, but the sweeps are more, are more cost effective. So if we can, if that will work and it's, it's effective for the operator, I typically try to go that route just to help the operators save some, save some money. Okay. Gotcha. And then do you see, 
Um, so since, since it has an affinity metal and stuff, whenever you're pumping these, especially if it's in like a sweeper a pill form, you know, do you, <laughs> excuse my friend, do you, I'm, I'm recording at a family member's house today. So I'm <laughs> a little bit of a different environment here. I want to, especially if you guys are watching the video uh, recording of this podcast. Uh, but anyways, um, whenever you're pumping this, do you, do you um, have any concerns for it actually staying wanting to stay in like the drill string and actually not making, you know, the strongest bit of the concentration, you know, actually into the well bore. Right. Well, so most of the time when you, when you pump these pills down and it comes out of the drill string, as soon as it exits the bit, like I said, you'll see that drop in torque. So might be 20%, might be 30% uh, in oil based mud because it's just because it is already so slick or sometimes guys will run slim hole. And so they have a much, lower torque threshold and so that might be instead of 26,000 foot pounds it might be 15 or 18,000 foot pounds and so they're looking for just to stay under that limit so they're not tearing up their pipe or and like I said twisting off okay gotcha yeah well so that's definitely uh, so you see that per, you see that pretty well widely used even in, in other basins and everything too just whenever what they get kind of past that that two mile or uh, two mile lateral length. Yeah, and and it and it like I said, it depends on what fluid system you're running. But we're doing we're doing work all over the U.S. and internationally as well. But so right now, uh, there's an operator in Haynesville, and so they have a, a bad tangent in their intermediate. So they're actually running it in their intermediate, and we see it out here in the Permian as well to help them get through kind of that, <laughs> that curve in the well to to help them slide through that. So. That's a, another common application. I wouldn't say it's as popular as taking that torque off, but there's definitely happens more than you would think just because the way some of these wells are drilled and, and kind of um, corkscrew effect. Mm -hmm. And then in Wyoming, it's hit or miss. Some operators up there are playing around with some different mud systems. And so we were able to help as they drill these further and further ladder. Because, you know, if, it's, uh, if they're used to mile and a half lateral and now they're drawing two and a half mile laterals. They want to have something as insurance so that they don't get in a bind up there. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Yeah, and then um, in terms of um, whenever this, whenever you get into even more, uh, well, actually let me ask this, is torque pretty much typically the, the limiting factor with you know, how far you can drill out? Is that typically the, the big limiter? Uh, yes and no. So it, it depends if you talk to the land team, because especially in around, say, in the Eagleford, middle Eagleford area, not necessarily South Texas, where you have these big ranches. But out here in West Texas, you might have a landowner or a rancher that has 100,000 acres. So you can drill as far as you can. Whereas when you get closer to, say, Fort Worth or somewhere, these leases might end or they might have to, you might have to drill a shorter lateral because you can't. You can't drill as long, or that or that uh, mineral owner might not want you to drill on their land. So, yeah, I would say torque is very much a contributing factor, and then the production guys might also have something to say. But yeah, yeah as you get further and further out, it just keeps going up and up. Yeah, no, there's definitely a lot of lot of things at the the kind of corporate level that go into lateral length determination, but kind of more so operationally is kind of what I had in mind. But yeah, so it sounds like it's definitely a uh, pretty big contributing factor there. So in terms of, you know, when, when lubricants aren't enough, I know you guys have another uh, solution for it, right? To, to really <laughs> get you further out if needed. So uh, drilling beads, right? I'm, I'm curious yeah, to learn yeah. more about this. I've, I've, <laughs> I don't, I've never really had anybody tell me about them. So Yeah, so drilling beads are, some people love them, some people hate them. So in one month you might sell out, and, uh, the next month no one wants to buy them. It's just, it's such a, <laughs> a love or hate product, but really there's three types of beads. You have glass, copolymer, and then we offer ceramic beads. And the reason we offer ceramic beads is because they have a very high compressive strength and which makes them highly crush resistance. And also they have a higher specific gravity. So that means that they'll sink to the bottom of the wellbore where the friction is occurring. So if you were to spot a, Kind of a slicker pill but when you run casing and guys will run it in their lateral to uh, three to five percent sweeps but i'd say most often operators will run 
these for casing runs. And so they'll, they'll just spot it as they're coming out along the, the well bore. And so when that casing comes down, it'll just float right on top of it and then and go all the way to the bottom. And, and it won't be crushed. And also with these ceramic beads, they can tolerate very high bottom hole temperatures. And then with it, so with the glass and the polymer beads, operators will run a bead recovery unit sometimes. And so as the fluids are, as are getting circulated out, they'll go through an actual a unit that recovers uh, a percentage of beads, 80%, 90%, whatever it might be. And so that way you can continue to rerun those. But the issue that operators are telling us is, man, these, these, these beads are flattening due to the weight or high temperature or whatever. So that's when we'll see operators switch to our ceramic beads. And literally they're just small beads. Uh, so it's, and they typically come in 50 pound sacks or we have them in buckets that way they won't get torn up on location. But yeah, just, just very, very small beads and looks like silica or something that, that would come in those little packets when you get food. Yeah. So I was wondering, uh, you're talking about how um, the beads are used when drilling laterally, but um, is there ever a case when you're using, um, I guess, more than just one of these different solutions? As far as the bead types? Um, as far as um, combined together, for example, would you ever use the drill lube HT as well as the drill beads? Yeah, so we actually used to have a product, it was called DL Glide, and that was lube and beads mixed. But typically, if somebody's going to run lube, they don't want beads or, or vice versa. It's traditionally one or the other, but you will see it sometimes, or they'll use beads and uh, for a casing run, and then they're using lube as they drill the lateral. So it just, mm -hmm. it really depends. And then, but yeah, most additive companies will have a product that have beads and lube mixed. I'm curious what this kind of looks like whenever you um, are actually trying to get into the system or like trying to pump, a, do, you, do you pump pills of this or what? And like, does it, do you see any effects or concerns on the actual like pump equipment at surface or actually, you know, like the beads going through the bit? or like clogging anything off or like damaging, you know, the directional, you know, if, especially if they're you know, using a pulsation tool for the mud system, like do you see any concerns um, operating that end with the beads? Well, the beads are so small. So you're just like with LCM, you're going to be limited by what you can pump through your tools. So directional say we can only pump 25 pound per barrel through our tools without clogging it up. Um, and so with our drill beads, we'll pump three, three to five pound per barrel, which is, not very much to go through directional tools. So uh, we try to keep it on that lower end to avoid plugging any bit or anything like that. But really anything uh, with, at least with the ceramic beads, anything over five pound per barrel, that's going to be overkill. Okay. Gotcha. And so there's no, not really a concern on how does it get into the system? Is it, I assume before the pump systems, right? So how would you um, I assume there's no issues really there if it's small enough to go through all the, the, like the directional tools and stuff downhole. Right, right. Exactly. And so, um, once we get an LCM, we'll kind of go over it, but there's many, many large circulation materials that are actually bigger than these beads. So you just have to have to watch oh, okay. what you're pumping. And gotcha. then there's different types of beads. So you have coarse beads, fine beads, whatever. And so mm -hmm. it just depends on that as well. And then is it, is it hard to get out of the mud system too? So like if you're not trying to get it, use it on, on a next well, right? If they're getting to another well on the pad or something, and you talk about having a filter to get it out. Um, is that something that you, know, you might have to sit and kind of circulate on a few times to get it out of the system? Or is it okay to just kind of leave it there? I assume it's not something you rent, right? I'm sure they just pay for like whatever they consume um, on location. So I'm just curious on that end. Yeah, so typically the bead recovery unit will have a day rate. So they're paying X amount of, of money to run this. And then they're paying X amount per sack for these beads, at least the glass or coke polymer beads. And so no, they're gonna pay on both ends usually. Sometimes they'll get beads for free if they have the recovery, if they're running the recovery unit. But any bead and, and with our ceramic bead, it's going to, at some point, it's gonna get kicked out of the system. It's gonna go over shaker screens and, and it's gonna get kicked out just because mm -hmm things are so turbulent down there, you know, it's just gonna, it's gonna get caught in the mud and then can get circulated out. But that's where the bead recovery unit would recover those beads. But again, uh, mm -hmm. it, a lot of operators are having issues with those beads flattening. And so 
one of the main benefits of having drill beads it's a, is a, that it's around the so when it flattens, it's not much help if it's not able to roll, the case it's not able to roll over that. So Right. Do you see a lot of kind of uh, pile up in a sense, um, you know, within little dog legs or like, I, don't know, I mean, the, the bit isn't making a perfectly round hole, right? So like, does it get kind of piled up in like ledges or something like that um, where it's not, I mean, we would want to picture it like in a round pipe on a perfectly round hole and just kind of lays there, right? But everything's always moving. You got... Uh, fluid always being circulated stuff. So do you see kind of like, I'll say like cluster point or cluster areas um, or like, I assume I won't, none of it, nobody can see it, but like in modeling or whatever, um, is that kind of thought to be the case? Yeah. Sometimes you'll see that. And it's, you know, if your if your lateral is porpoising, so going up and down those beads, or at least the ceramic beads will sink to the bottom. And so mm -hmm. at some points they will, they might cluster, but at most at some point, most of those just due to the turbulent flow, will get kicked out of the system, but you okay. will have areas where it, it'll, it'll lay in those low lying areas. Okay. And, and that's basically what, I mean, it's designed to do that, <laughs> you know, yeah, I, exactly, but, exactly. But, <laughs> I was just curious, you know, how, how uh, extensively that would, that would happen or something. So mm -hmm. I'm trying to get to, you know, the love hate relationship that you're talking about to kind of get both sides of this. So <laughs> but yeah. Definitely and, and, pretty again, interesting stuff. and again, opinions vary from glass or polymer or uh, if they want to run a recovery in it, it's just, it's it's funny, but it's one of the more polarizing products out here in the, in the oil field, <laughs> at least on the fluid side, because people would say, oh, I've always ran glass beads since 1980 or whatever. But you know, so, yeah, it just depends. <laughs> okay. Well, so if anybody's listening and wants to show up on a drill site and start a fight, um, this would be the way to maybe get one kicked off, huh? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> at least with the, the consultants or people in charge. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Good to know. <laughs> All right. So anything else you wanted to mention on the, the, the bead side or do you want to move on to, to LCM? Yeah, let's move on to the fun stuff. Lost circulation material. So on a drill cam, we call it sealants. It's commonly referred to as LCM. And so with, as the name implies, it's used to stop fluids from, or losses from, fluids from losses. Um, and so with lost circulation events, I mean, you can causes all kinds of issues. One, oil based mud is expensive. So that mud is rented to the operator. So whatever, uh, at the end of the well, when, whenever they take that mud back and then they're looking it over, whatever, how many, how many ever barrels of mud are missing, that's what you're gonna have to pay for. So it can get really expensive. And also it's a safety issue. So if you are trying to keep uh, the formation fluids from coming in, then sometimes you might have to weight your mud up. Well, when that happens, you might exceed the fracture gradient of the formation. So you might open those fractures up that weren't there before. And so it becomes a well more stability issue. So losing the hole, we've seen that a few times, which is never good, or packing off. Sometimes you have to sidetrack, it's kind of decrease RFP. And so there's different levels of losses. So sometimes you'll hear seepage, which or light seepage might be zero to five, seepage might be five to 10 or 15, heavy seepage 15 to 30. It's kind of a, a loose term. Uh, sometimes in the eagle for you, you'll hear guys saying, I'm not having any returns or I'm having heavy seepage and they're only losing a few barrels an hour. So it really depends on where you're at. But out here in the permit, uh, some, some operators take total losses, which means you're not getting anything back. And that just becomes a, a pretty, Pretty bad scenario. And typically, that's how we'll get called out to the location first because they've tried cement, doing squeezes, they, uh, which didn't work or whatever. So we come in behind them or hopefully we're their first call, which uh, after they see our, our blockade perform, which I'll touch on here in a minute, uh, they'll typically stick with that. But out here in the Permian, some issue, I mean, some areas are, are just so depleted because they've been drilled up and there's so many vertical wells they've been producing for decades. So there's really not a lot of pressure. So when the pressure inside uh, the well bore exceeds the formation, then it's going to go into the formation. So that depleted sands is a, is a pretty big issue we see, but one of the, the main issues that we're seeing now are those flows. So some of these zones like the San Andreas are so pressured up because there's so many injection wells around there. I've, saw a figure recently that I think it was 120 to 140 million barrels of water are getting injected just into the San Andreas. So you can imagine all that water down there in that formation, as you drill through, if the formation pressure 
is more than what's in your wellbore. It's just going to come into your wellbore. And so that's when the guys will wait up their mud and, and you know, might blow it out. Hopefully not, but sometimes, and by blowing it out, I mean, they weren't having any losses before. And then once they exceed that fracture gradient, now they're losing five barrels an hour. Then it goes up to 10 or 15. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and then, do you, is this, is most of this in the vertical section? Um, then I assume as you're going through all these different um, historic zones, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And uh, for example, another operator, they were, as they were drilling, they were taking really bad flows. And so they had these water trucks coming in and out to haul away the water, which was, it, which is expensive in itself, hundred barrel an hour flows. And then they were taking it to the SWD, injecting it. And then basically it was going down into that zone and then back into the well bore, you know, just as a high level overview, but it was just so charged up. But on the Midland side, you have the spray berry, the clear fork, which are really bad areas for losses. And on the Delaware side, Brushy, Cherry Canyon, especially on Carlsbad, Pecos area can be really bad. But some operators will drill as quickly as they can just to get through those lost zones. And then they'll case it off. So instead of running a three-string casing design, they'll run a four-string casing design. So drill as quickly as you can. You might be taking some losses. You're dry drilling without returns, but you know we, we know we can get through. And once they once they TD that intermediate, then they'll just case it off and and get it behind pipe. Okay, gotcha. And then um, whatever you're talking about, um, so, well, I guess so. So you see people eliminating. Um, potentially uh, even casing strings if they use, um, you know, some of the, the LCM material potentially to, you know, if they know they're going to take some, some losses, you know, they can be ready for it. They can pump some LCM and it can actually save money by basically cutting out, you know, a, a, like a second intermediate casing string or something like that. Have you seen that as applications for your products? Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. We, we've, we've helped a lot of operators out by cutting out a uh, string of casing, which, you know, can get expensive. It takes time. Mm -hmm. And so we do that with our blockade product, which is our, our squeeze product. It's our, I say our, our most sexy product, but <laughs> we'll use that um, for if, if an operator is having total losses. So if they're not getting any returns back and that's, we'll go out there and we'll mix up our blockade and we might use some of our first strike, which I'll, I'll touch on here in a second, but we'll, uh, we'll basically go down, spot that pill, circulate on top of it, it'll go into formation, uh, close your pipe rams, pressure up, it'll dewater, go into formation, and then you're golden. So we've definitely helped some operators just cut out a string of casing because, say, if, if it is a spray berry, then, you know, we've had these issues in the spray berry. We don't want to put it behind pipe. We're trying to cut drilling or day, rig days. So how can you help us out? Okay, gotcha. And then... Um, so on the, whatever you're talking about, actually, you know, doing the, the squeeze or even pumping, um, the LCM, are you always kind of pumping it? So, I mean, you, you don't always know, right. If it, if your bits, let's say you're like 7,000 foot down or something, you don't know if it's, you know, coming, you know, the, the lost circulation zone, if it's, you know, 3000 feet down or if it's, you know, 7,000, it's like, so I assume you can just kind of pump, um, the material from wherever your bit is, right. And it'll just find that zone. Or do you typically try to uh, locate it somehow by moving the the bit around or I don't know doing float. I don't know what you, you would even do honestly um, to try and track it down and actually pump it uh, right at the face of it almost. I'd say most of the time the operators you know when they started taking losses, they might say, "Well, you know, we started seeping at seven thousand foot and now they're eighty five hundred foot and losses got really bad." So most operators know, you know, they're they're seeing that that their return's not coming in and, you know, the mud engineer will come out. So best case scenario, they know what's going on and we can go down there at 7,500 foot or whatever it is and just uh, pull up above it, spot that pill. Or, you know, if, if they say, well, there's multiple zones that that geology has, has identified, then that's when we'll pump sweeps with our LCM. And there's all kind of, of LCM out there. Most rigs will have a conventional Generic LCM that's cheaper, such as cotton seed holes, which just like it sounds, uh, holes from cotton seeds just from mm -hmm. cross cedar fiber, which is just strands of, of, of cedar, drilling paper. Uh, you'll see fibrous materials such as crushed up pecan or walnut holes, nut plug. And so <laughs> operators will, will pump that first just because it, 
it's cheap. And so I say, well, let's pump this and, and see if this mic will help or whatever it might be to see if it'll, it'll uh, knock our losses down first. But the problem with that is, is that eventually the stuff, even though it is cheap, starts to add up. So I always like to tell operators, you know, it might be $4 a sack, but if you're pouring an 18 wheeler full of cottonseed holes down hole, at some point, it makes sense to bring us on location to punch these losses in the mouth, get them under control, and then just pump sweeps as need be. That way you're not fighting it the whole way and, and really running up that cost. But I mean, even talking to some of these company made out here or, or older mud engineers, they will tell you stories about shredded up diapers or shredded up muddy, you know, just, <laughs> I mean, just crazy stuff that, Oh my goodness. yeah, back in the day, I mean, they would just pump anything that uh, they could get their hands on down hold <laughs> because you, you really, ideally you want um, a large particle size distribution range. And what that means is the higher the micron size, the bigger the particle size. So, Hair is between 60 and 80 microns. A typical grain of sand is like 100. And so use, choosing which LCM de depends on which formation you're in, uh, what, what depth you're at. We have a lot of case histories just from the amount of work we've done. We say, well, you know, from this rig right next to you, here's what we use that worked. So, but then in, in some other areas, in your intermediates, they typically – have larger micro fractures and so we have our drill seal which is a medium fibrous blend mostly used in intermediate and it can be pumped up to 50 pound per barrel and so your directional guys will say oh man you know we can't pump anything over 25 but we've we've never plugged anything with drill seal and and so uh but sometimes we do have to tailor it back because they said no 25 is the most we're going to do and so we'll typically run that in the intermediate with our first strike, which is a medium granular blend, and that's ran in the intermediate as uh, with drill seal, and drill seal acts as a bridging agent. So if you're visually, if you're thinking about it, you want you want to have a bigger particle size for this micro fracture to kind of lay across it as that bridging agent. And then with your granular LCM, that will kind of come in there and, and fill in those spaces in between. So if you're thinking about like a, a sink if you if you have just a bunch of big rocks and small rocks and you're trying to plug the sink up it won't work so you, most of the time you have to have those medium-sized rocks as well so that way small rocks can bridge off on that and and so uh, with the first strike it, it's also ran in the lateral as well so really it just depends where you're at in the lateral we we tend to see smaller micro fractures uh, once you get further out so we'll treat that with our FIT and that's a fine granular material. And we'll, we'll use the first strike as a bridging agent with that FIT. And so that way, as, as you're drilling out, you can pump sweeps and sometimes it could be uh, 20 pound per barrel each or, or typically you're gonna mix two. And then, but you know, with cedar fiber, you might only be able to pump five pound per barrel just because it is so coarse, but like with our, our combat, which is our very coarse LCM, it has a huge particle size range. And uh, it's not really MWD compatible. So if some operators know that they're gonna be drilling through a bad area, just based on prior experience, then uh, they might even run a bypass sub. And so basically you drop a ball down drill pipe, it'll, it'll set on top, and then you can run that coarse LCM around the tools. And so that way you don't have to worry about plugging it up and it acts as a bridging agent. But yeah, so with your motors, your MWDs, your rotary steerables, that's really your limiting factor. And then some guys might make a trip and then go in open-ended or run a, a bit without nozzles so they can pump as, as much as they need to be without having to worry about being limited by power per barrel. Okay, gotcha. No, definitely and pretty interesting. Uh, to have have the different options and, and whatnot. And I've actually seen some of the the we contact like the bypass tools out, but of course there's there's pros and cons of that. But you know nobody nobody wants uh, have lost circulation. But <laughs> sounds like it's pretty common uh, down there. It is, and sometimes you feel like the Grim Reaper, and you have to knock <laughs> on the door when you go to talk to some of these guys. But yeah. the way I look at it, it's like life insurance. If you need it, we're here for you. Obviously, we want to get you out. Of <laughs> get you out of a bind as cost effectively as we can. And then uh, we have operators too that will utilize our lab. We do 
it's called slot testing. And basically that's just a, a piece of metal and geology might say, we're looking at crossing an area that is three millimeters. What products do you have that will help us get past this and how will it be applied? So in our lab, we'll simulate a real life scenario. We'll, we'll, we'll run some different products for that. We'll do complete testing for them and then send them that report. So that way they know uh, what exactly we have that will help that certain issue that they're in. Um, yeah. So in terms of times, you know, we're definitely have to, to wrap up here towards the end of the episode. Um, Jacob, do you have any other questions in terms of all these, um, all these out of stuff? We've talked about a lot of things today. Uh, yes. So there is one thing you talked about. Um, I guess a lot of the times when you are called out due to the LCM is a result of differential pressure between the formation and the wellbore. Is there other scenarios, I guess, like other things that could happen that would result in y'all being called out? Are you talking about, oh, go ahead. Uh, for example, like, is there any, like, oftentimes y'all are called out maybe um, as a result of casing integrity or something of that nature? Yeah, yeah, for sure. And some operators will actually short set their casing for whatever reason. And so that's when we'll go in there, say the spray berry, like we talked about earlier, or we'll go in there and we'll use our blockade to, to seal off where they short set that casing at because it's, it's just like cement. It has a very high compressive screen, but it won't flash set on you. So, and also uh, we can use first strike or something else as that bridging agent. So that way you're not just pumping away all that cement into formation. Okay. Gotcha. Well, thanks guys so much for uh, you know, being on the episode with me and, and, and Cole for sharing all this. We've definitely covered a lot and we've got a lot of exciting things um, to talk more about in the Lunch and Learns. I know we kind of had to stay pretty high level on, on all this, but uh, I'll let uh, Jacob and, and you kind of explain you know, to our audience you know, what to expect coming up uh, with, with partnership between Oil for Basics and um, Drill Chem. Yes. So uh, we will be partnering together for a four-part uh, LinkedIn webinar series between Oilfield Basics and Drill Kim. This will be starting on June 30th. I believe that is a Tuesday from 12 to 1, so perfect for lunchtime. Um, this will be one per week, and I will kind of off of what we've gone over today, I'll kind of let Cole talk about um, what you can expect to get out of it. Yeah, so it'll be a four part series. Uh, number one, our engineers will go more in depth on loss circulation material, go over some case histories, areas that we see bad losses, kind of go more in depth on the things that I talked about doing a squeeze and which will be our, the topic of our second one, which is blockade squeeze product. And then the third one will be drilling lubricants. How is it spotted? Uh, how's it ran, some torque issues, examples. And then on the completion side, we'll be going over completion chemicals and then our mixing plants that we have as well. And uh, if you, you need to stay on the lookout on our Oilfield Basics LinkedIn page or from either Derek, myself, or some of the other interns, but we will actually be posting a schedule or start marketing the webinar series probably starting early next week. So pay attention and be on the lookout. Yeah. <laughs> and so a little bit of the timing delay too. So I mean, by the time, you know, when this podcast is released, definitely uh, check out our website, check out uh, you know, our LinkedIn pages and stuff. We'll be posting registration links to to get signed up for it and make sure you guys don't miss it. So, and you know, this is meant to be an introductory um, type of podcast into these, into this world and into these, uh, these different additives. And then we're going to go way more in depth in, in the month on, on the launch and learn. So definitely excited to, to have that and be a good complimentary to this material. And then we're also going to be doing something very similar with uh, completions of work over stuff coming up soon with drill cam. So keep an eye out for all that. Um, definitely excited to, to have more material on this and really be a good resource for anybody who's coming out into drilling ops trying to figure out how to, how to deal with these issues. So we're excited to, to have this on our site. So Cole, thanks so much for, for being with us here today and, and Jacob for co-hosting with me. It's been a pleasure to have you guys both on. Thank you for having me. Derek, Jacob, I appreciate it. And we'll see you on the next one. <laughs> thanks guys. And thanks to our listeners too for, for joining. Uh, be sure to catch us in the next episode. In the meantime, stay healthy, stay safe and take care guys. Bye.